Hello everyone, my name is Andy Shin and I work for Inve Thailand. On behalf of my co-authors and I, we would like to thank FAO and the organisers of this workshop for the very kind invitation to speak. And today I would like to give some insight into the big problems we see from tiny travellers by giving you a whirlwind global look at some key parasites found on cultured species of tilapia. I'm sure you're all well aware that aquaculture has a long and rich history. The ancient Chinese were culturing carp in ponds for food well over 5,000 years ago, and a little later on, so were the ancient Egyptians. There is in the tomb of Neverman, a middle-ranking scribe and grain accountant near Luxor, a series of beautiful paintings on the wall of his tomb. One of these shows a fish, which appears to be a tilapia, swimming below his boat. This fish is interesting because it has a large belly, which is very similar to this fish, a tilapia with streptococcus infection. From this, I would like to think that for as long as we have been growing fish, we've also had to deal with sick fish and their diseases. Of the species that we now culture, some species like Mozambique tilapia, Nile perch, rainbow trout, brown trout, carp, walking catfish, and largemouth bass are now listed among the world's top 100 worst invasive species. These are not invasive because of their independent ability to translocate, but are good invaders because we've moved them there. Through our passions, we have moved species for aquaculture, sport, and the ornamental trade. Sadly, as we have done so, we've also spread fish diseases with them. We are here today not only to celebrate the successes in the aquaculture of tilapias, but also to look at aspects of their health. For today's short talk, I want us to first take a quick look at production and their global distribution. And you can see from this table that I've listed some of the important species and that we are collectively approaching around 7 million tons worth of production, a staggering 4.8 million tons of which is produced in countries outside the native range of tilapias in Africa. You can also see that almost half the tilapia landed through capture fisheries is also from countries outside of Africa. What is also interesting is the number of countries into which tilapia have been introduced, which is well over 120. The first reported introduction was into the Serang River in Java in 1939. Today we are still farming in 97 countries. In our review paper that has been prepared for this workshop, we have summarised over 820 movements of tilapia. So for more details on this, please do stay in touch. OK, so having taken a very brief look at the tilapia, what about the tiny travellers that they have carried with them? We looked at 2,500 parasite records, and we provide details of these in our paper. If we now take a sprint through the key parasite groups, I would like to point out just a few interesting cases to you. Starting with the protists, we see mortalities of Nile tilapia in Brazil due to trypanosomes. These typically require a leech as an intermediate host. However, Given that each trypanosome has a narrow host range, but certain leech species have a very wide distribution, it is likely that the trypanosomes have spread with shipments of tilapia and then used local leech populations. The picture for apicomplexans like Gusia cichlidarum, which can damage uh, the swim bladder, this is less clear. Many apicomplexan species appear to be restricted to Africa, and so the records of these, for example, from the Philippines, Papua New Guinea and Vietnam, which were not identified to the species level, need to be confirmed. Evidence of translocation of ciliated protozoans like Trichodina is much clearer. Trichodinas can be identified by the morphology of their cytoskeleton, and you can probably make out the shape of some of the interlocking blades in this photo. We have therefore been able to confirm the translocation of certain species to the Philippines, Thailand, Bangladesh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico and China as just a few examples. As this is a parasitology talk, I am frequently asked about infections of trichodina and what to do. So very quickly, if you see one or two trichodina per field of view at times four magnification, then this is perhaps nothing to worry about. No immediate action is needed, but do note their presence and continue to monitor numbers closely on your stocks. If you start to see two to 10 trichodina, 
per times four field of view, then I would advise you look at water quality, check your feed and waste management, make sure that you're not overfeeding, check or reduce stocking density. Again, no immediate treatment may be necessary, but monitor numbers closely. Remember that trichodiana numbers will increase quickly in organic rich waters. If, however, you start seeing over 10 trichodiana per times four field of view, or see very high numbers like this, then immediate action is needed. Again, address water quality, waste management, check feed regimes and reduce stocking density. A treatment may be required and please seek veterinary advice in this, as the choice of treatment regime will depend on several factors, including the size of fish, their biomass and the level of existing tissue damage. Jumping forward to the mixozoans, this quote from one of the co-authors on this paper says things clearly, that despite the importance of the group, infections are sporadic, localized or are frequently overshadowed by other infections and are controlled either by management or by apathy. And sadly, they are frequently overlooked or ignored. This is the typical life cycle of a mixosporian and their requirement for specific intermediate hosts like certain oligochaetes may limit the likelihood of these establishing in new areas. So of the records that we currently know about, these may represent misidentifications rather than from in infections establishing and spilling back or from infections from other hosts. Looking now at the oomycetes or the water molds and fungi, these are emerging pathogens with an increasing geographic spread. A good example of this is Aphanomyces invadens, responsible for epizootic ulcerative syndrome, an OIE listed disease which is spread through the trade in live animals. Fortunately, tilapias are, are quite resistant. The hyphae cannot proliferate and lesions are restricted to the site of infection. The report of other species like branchiomyces, which infects the gills though, is quite different. Infections in tilapia can cause respiratory distress with mortalities in water temperatures over 20 degrees centigrade. I would now like to talk about the monogenia and I really like this class of parasites. I'm going to start with Gyrodactylus. This is a small worm about 0.8 to 1 millimeter long. It is colorless. It is found on the skin and gills of its fish host and is an epidermal grazer. It has no eyes, has two large central hooks and 16 small hooks that it uses to attach to its host. It gives birth to live young and here you can see the hooks of the daughter and then the hooks of a granddaughter inside the daughter. It is a bit more complicated than that because for the first birth these three stages are actually all sisters. In these pictures and videos you can see that these parasites are very active and that numbers on small fish can build up very quickly. One species, Gyrodactylus cyclodarum, has been responsible for the mortality of tilapia fry worldwide. I now want to show you another species. This is Cyclodagyrus. It lives on the gills and is a blood feeder. It has four eyes and a black body. These species produce eggs rather than live young. They attach to their host using two sets of large hooks, two connecting bars and 14 small marginal hooks. The shape of these hooks are used to identify species. Cyclodagyrus is a very important genus of parasite. We know about 72 different species on tilapines and oreochromids, etc. And about 60 species are known from the important aquaculture species of tilapia. Just to show you how important these parasites are, in this table we have listed some of the monogenian species that have full passports. At the top, you can see Gyrodactylus cyclodarum, which has already been reported from 13 countries outside of Africa. And this is followed closely by species like Cyclodagyrus tilapi and Cyclodagyrus sclerosis. With this in mind, it is possible that the tilapia infecting monogenians may become the most widespread tropical freshwater fish parasites given the global distribution of tilapias. In Mexico, we know that of the 40 helminth species that have been introduced, 33 are monogenians and 14, 14 of these were introduced with tilapias. One important thing I would like to say is that while some parasite species are responsible for the direct loss of stocks, parasites also play a key role in facilitating the establishment of secondary pathogens like fungi, viruses and bacteria. In this slide, we're looking at the attachment organ of Gyrodactylus. 
and we can see how the hooks penetrate the epithelium, creating holes. And also you can see lots of lovely bacteria on the fish skin. Just to highlight how important this is, Gyrodaxis infections, among other species, have been linked to the establishment of serious bacterial pathogens of farm tilapia, species like Streptococcus and Aeromonas hydrophila. Before we leave the monogenia, we must mention the capsulids. Most of the parasites we have talked about so far are parasites infecting tilapias predominantly in fresh water, but the capsalids, and here I mean species like Nea benedenia, infect salinity tolerant species of tilapia, like Mozambique tilapia, in brackish or in marine systems. Although capsalids are not recorded as being moved with fish stocks, they do become infected from the environment into which they have been moved. And very interestingly, species like Nea benedenia are regarded as an invasive species which has been broadly translocated. Okay, let us say goodbye to the monogenia and move on to the digenia. The digenia are an important class of parasite, which includes many species that can infect man if we eat raw or undercooked fish. This slide here shows a tilapia from Africa, infected with metasocarial stages, juvenile stages if you like, of a digenian called uvilifer, which can cause slow growth, deformities, and increase the mortality rate of freshwater fish. The good news is because digenians have complicated multi-stage life cycles, no species of digenian have been found outside of their native Africa. In a slight twist to this though, we have seen some digenian species switching host. For example, in Mexico and Brazil, we have seen Ostrodiplostomum compactum, a species which is commonly found in native cichlids, infects and causes serious eye problems in cultured Nile tilapia. Moving on to cestodes, the tapeworms, there is one species that is worth mentioning. This is the Asian tapeworm, Shizacotli achilignathi. Infections have been reported from wild and farmed populations of Nile and Mozambique tilapia in South Africa, Cuba, Mexico and Nigeria. Looking quickly at nematodes, many of the species that we know about are larval species of Contrasecum, which typically use a fish-eating bird as their final host. These parasites are important because they have the potential to infect man. We have also seen host switching in some nematode species. For example, we have seen a nematode which is commonly found in eels and causes damage to the swim bladder, switching host to infect Nile tilapia found in Belgium and in Egypt. One other important nematode species we must mention is Nathostoma, which causes creeping disease in humans. Man typically gets infected by eating raw or undercooked fish, wild freshwater shrimps, or frogs. You can see the armored head in this image at the top here. In brief, there is lots that we do not know about nematode infections of tilapias, and there is still lots to do. We only know of about nine species of acanthocephalon, or thorny-headed worms from tilapias. And although certain species like Acanthogyrus tilapi, which has a broad host range and a wide distribution in Africa, we only know of one possible translocation of this species, which is to Madagascar, with the movement of non-native cichlids. However, there is insufficient evidence to confirm this. Moving on to the crustacea, these are another important group of parasites, and we summarize many host parasite records in our paper. Two species that are worthy of note are Agazalus, which are not strictly host specific, and have been recorded on tilapias from Indonesia, Mexico, and Philippines. And then the second species is Lernia. There are several species of Lernia. Most are restricted to Africa, but there is one record of Lernia lofiaria, which has been translocated with Oreochromis mozambicus to Thailand. In the picture here, you can see a specimen of Lernia, which typically has its head and antlers embedded in the fish's tissues, causing irritation and a localized proliferative hyperplastic tissue response which encapsulates the parasite. It should be noted that Lernia cyprinacea is a very invasive species, having been spread worldwide. It is well known on tilapias in Africa, and this is a tiny traveller we should be aware of. Likewise, Neo agazalus japonicus has a low host specificity and appears to have spread through aquaculture and the aquarium trade. It is, for example, recorded on Mozambique and Nile tilapia in Japan. 
One other very important group of crustacean copepods we must mention are the argulids. Arguably one of the most important group of fish parasites in the world. Infections result in marked health impacts and losses to stock. Three quick species to mention are Argulus japonicus, which appears to be very cosmopolitan, Argulus corrigoni, which has been reported from red tilapia in Malaysia, and Argulus indicus, which has also been recorded from red tilapia, but in Thailand. Last and by no means least, leeches are also worth mentioning. Leeches, in addition to causing physical trauma to their host as they feed, can also act as vectors of viral, bacterial and hemoprotozoans. Leeches are commonly seen in earth pond systems, and we do not have any evidence to suggest that they have been translocated. One interesting finding, though, was the marine leech Zelonica badella argiomensis, which is a parasite of Mozambique tilapia in brackish water in Japan and Sri Lanka which was recently found to be the vector of Haemogregorina curvata and trypanosomes. This highlights the potential biosecurity risk that this leech may pose to stocks reared in brackish and marine waters. In closing, I wanted to highlight the importance of health certification, health surveillance and aquaculture biosecurity, which sets out to facilitate the trade of live animals while at the same time decreasing the risks or in spreading infectious diseases to acceptable levels. The paper we have just submitted to reviews in aquaculture looks at over 820 tilapia movements and provides data on over 2,500 host parasite records. We hope our study helps raise awareness regarding the capacity of some of these tiny travellers to spread, and we hope that the study will serve as a useful resource for those working with the health of tilapia. As my final slide, I would like to say thank you to the FAO and the organisers once again. This study has been the product of 16 enthusiastic researchers, all working with tilapia, representing 13 nationalities across six continents. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening.